Okay, and we're ready to go. Welcome back to another podcast, everyone. My name is Mike Perrine. This is the Everyday Detox Podcast. And if you're watching this podcast, you're probably watching it on YouTube. If you're listening, you may be listening on iTunes, but we are now available on Spotify, on Stitcher, on TuneIn, and on Google Play, whatever those things are. So any avenue you like to consume your podcast vibrations, you can find us. So um, anyway, I thank you for listening to this podcast. By the way, somebody sent me a great message. I love getting all the feedback from everyone about doing this podcast. Someone sent me a great message through Instagram. I accidentally deleted it and like declined messages from that person. Total mistake on my part. I feel horrible about that. If that was you and you're listening to this, please send me that message again at Everyday Detox on Instagram. Send it again. I was a few sentences in. It was a little bit lengthy. You said some really nice things that were very heartfelt. And I wanted to see the rest of it. And I hit the wrong button and poof, it was gone. And I got all screwed up. So my apologies if that were you. I appreciate that feedback. So uh, this podcast, Gil Jacobs is back. Gil is the most requested podcast guest of all time. Uh, And for good reason. Gil's got a lot of very interesting ideas. Some of them are a little bit eccentric. He definitely thinks outside of the box. That's what led him into the the work that he does and into the lifestyle that he leads. So uh, Gil's always a favorite. We got into stuff late one night in January back at Vitality in New York City. I think we started the podcast at like 10 p.m. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I don't want to make this podcast intro longer than it needs to be because I tend to do that sometimes. Uh, So let's jump right in. Gil Jacobs, welcome back, my man. Thank you. You know, you are the most requested podcast guest that I've ever had. Really? Yes. People love Dr. Bishy. They love when Bex comes on. They love some other people, but you are the most requested oh, that's podcast nice. guest over the years. And it's been four years. I don't. I re-uploaded all the podcasts to something called, um, it's just a different hosting place. And I think it was March 14th, 2014 that we yeah. did it. It's been a long time, mm-hmm. my man. Welcome back. Yeah, Glad man. to be here. I love how New York this podcast turned out to be because I was trying to schedule something with you. And I'm always telling people like, yeah, Gil's going to come back or so-and-so is going to come back. But, you know, we work a lot and, and scheduling is hard. And like I sent you a, uh, a text and you were like, yeah, but nine o'clock is the only time I can start. And I was like, that's perfect. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, right. and Everyone now it's, else is in bed. But now it's 20 to 10 and like yeah. we're starting a podcast. <laughs> That's true. Half the people who follow this stuff have been in bed for two hours. Yeah. They got to wake up to down with dog at six in the morning. <laughs> they're they're going to have to watch the repeats. <laughs> so we started late because you were working. I was working. I just did a um, we just did a nutritional detox workshop here. And we had all of these people that were just kind of new to things. They were looking for help. They wanted to eat clean. And uh, I was trying to give them some perspective. We were talking about V equals P minus O, which is a concept that you introduced mm-hmm. me to from, from Professor Eric. It comes up on like every podcast. We always bring it back to that. And I was just, I was talking about how any successful diet is going to be based in cleansing and elimination. And I was getting all this feedback from people about what they see on the internet because the internet is now shines this oh. light and illuminates all of these different like food oh, I can things. Tell you like stories. you see everything. And mm-hmm. we have so like we have these people now. We have uh, we have raw foodists that are afraid to eat a piece of raw broccoli. Correct. We have uh, fruitarians that won't eat salt, but they'll get a whole bodysuit full of tattoos. Correct. Um, we have people that wake up in the morning and they're putting butter and oil and coffee and like yes. calling it like yes. uh, pretty names and stuff. And then like there's that. also a fruitarian recovery group for people who attempted to be fruitarian and almost died. And that's one of the most one of the biggest memberships on the internet and all the groups. I was surprised at the rise of the fruitarian movement. I thought I didn't th- I thought that was like when I first got into this and um well when I, I first got into like when I was first exposed to like those really clean little segments like the natural hygienists and the fruitarian mm-hmm. things and uh, Dr. Johnny Love Wisdom. Oh and yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like of course. That kind of like really radical f- spiritual fruit eating stuff. Um I, I looked at it and I thought, well, that's good. I, I thought it was at the end of its peak in, in 1999 when I was first turned on to it. And I saw it. I thought, well, who wants to live like that? There's so many like people, teenagers, 20-somethings traveling all over the world, like totally into super high fruit diets. I was amazed by it. Well, my kids put me on Facebook, unbeknownst to me, and I don't post anything, but I look and because I'm in this health thingy, I got hooked up with all these different groups. 
And one time, this poor fruitarian woman was getting butchered, you know, and being told all the wrong stuff. So I just put in very, I'm very, you know, strokes, nice and easy. Hey, sweetheart, I've been doing this kind of long. Might want to offer you another perspective, blah, blah, blah. And from that, totally unbeknownst to me, because only people who do this know who I am, I got like 300 thingies coming at me. Oh, you're the old guy in New York that does the colonics. And these kids who were 25 and less were so destroyed by attempting this radical fruitarianism. I did consultations with people in Hungary, Germany, China, all over the country. Just from this one little sentence I put to this person, and a lot of them are pissed and angry because the people teaching it, they're confusing the philosophical truth with the application, which is basically for no one in a Western country, especially if you're coming from a Caucasian background. Well, that's why I was you know? surprised because when I, like, when I first got into raw foods, in, uh, when it became popular, David Wolf wrote the Sun Food, um, Sun Food Diet Success System. And like he was first turned on to all like the radical movements of like the early days. I, was, I thought that because we had the internet and because you know the, all those people had already hit walls, I thought like, all right, we're gonna move on into something new. And then to see the resurgence was insane. I, I mean, and then a few years later, I saw Durian Ryder eating 30 bananas and I was like, haven't we known that doesn't work for the last 10, 15 years? Now, and if now you watch there. those people, the Australian couple, it started out all fruit, 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 but they were bikers, heavy bike riders, Yeah. right? And then later on, if you look, it was potatoes, rice, potatoes, rice in huge quantities. Now, yes. their explanation for the potatoes, rice was that they burned so many calories, they were so athletic, they needed caloric stimulation. But as you know, and I know what was happening was, it took a while, but the fruit diet started awakening a level of toxicity that was not leaving their body that they could not deal with. So whether they knew it or not, what they were doing was quelling the cleansing of the fruit with a lot of starch, which was training wheeling their bicycle, so to speak. And we see, you start with Herbert Shelton, if you read Herbert Shelton's career, by the end of the hygienist movement in the late 50s before he died, it was full of beans and rice and legumes. Now he didn't know why, the degeneration drove people to realize I've got to do something and they unknowingly grounded themselves, slowed down their cleanse with heavy food. And, and for people out there, you will find the occasional fruitarian that's doing pretty well. There's a kid on the internet I've spoken to a few times, but he's 19. I think he lives in Nicaragua. He comes from farmland parents and he's 19. I mean, there are 19 hero, 19 year old heroin addicts who were doing just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of professional athletes who are drug addicts who are doing fine because they're young and it hasn't hit them yet. So for anyone listening to this, do not attempt an all out exclusive fruit diet for more than like a week because in the long haul, it will not work for a whole bunch of reasons we can get into if you wish. Yes. It is the natural plan for humans to be fruitarians, yes. But we are not natural humans. And, and to me, if you asked me what separates our work from everyone else who's into radical nutrition, it's the emphasis, the intense emphasis on inherited energy. The lineage that bore you, if you're normal Euro background Caucasian, or if you're coming from any modern part of the world where your parents ate normally, and your lineage ate normally, we are all born mutated. We cannot take on the indigenous diet of humanity without a lot of help and a lot of tweaks. And since my kids put me on Facebook, this knowledge I always had has just come, excuse the bad pun, to fruition in all these people I'm meeting. Because I've spoken to probably 200 of them, and they're all pissed and angry and broken down. So it's just not a path. It's usually driven by ego. And if you look on the websites, a lot of the fruitarian people blast people who aren't vegan. The, they blast everybody. And that's how you know they're not feeling good. Yeah, there's a lot of anger, especially yeah. from Durian Ryder. Oh, sure. And, a lot and, of anger from that yeah. guy. The one thing we know is clean cells can't be mean. When you're cleansed, you get off the colonic table, you love everybody. People can give you the finger. You pat them on the back. When you're in a good high space cellularly, you don't strike out like that. And it, we've seen the anger. I see the things people print, calling people like 
you know, they're unconscious, they pay attention to this, and they eat like shit, and they're full of pus. I'm like, oh, this person needs a bunch of colonics because the fruit is rotting in his body. <laughs> so you're talking about, just to make it clear for people listening, you're talking about fruit sugar being exceptionally cleansing and awakening endogenous poison Correct. in the tissue. Correct. And people not having it release out of their tissue. And then it goes back into the tissue and eats them alive. And they get what's called sick skinny. And one of the classic symptoms of that is the eye pop. The eyes stop popping out of the head. From the pressure. Yeah, from yeah. the internalized pressure. And what's sad is a lot of people getting paid to counsel. Wait, not eye, not people's eyes popping and exploding. It <laughs> no, looks, it's on the verge. It's, 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 it's <laughs> eyes that are just protruding and suddenly getting Correct. really big. And, yeah. If you go back and look at the old British comedian Marty Feldman, Oh, yeah. You'll see what I mean he was, by the uh, eye pop. He was in Young Frankenstein, wasn't he? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, he was what hump. Yeah. What hump. But that was what he found it very good. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a shame because um, a lot of people are trying to do the right thing. And the extremity of this stuff. And then you turn around and there's the high protein, high fat people. Yeah. I got in an interaction and I was trying to be sweet with this 28-year-old guy who was eating raw eggs, white and yolk, which is deadly. Raw meat, raw dairy with some vegetables and counseling people. And I mean, we don't have the time to go into how much is wrong with that. Well, the, the, the reason that works, I mean, it's uh, the, almost I explained this to everybody at the workshop tonight, too. I was like, the reason all of these diets work and people lose weight is because everybody's starting with shit. They're starting exactly. with the standard American diet. Correct. They're putting down the pizza. Did you see, speaking of the internet, sometimes when I'm on the bus and I'm coming into the office in the morning, I'll watch these little videos on Snapchat and I watch the food accounts because I used to be a chef and it's shit that I would never eat. It's stuff that I haven't eaten in 22 years, mm -hmm. but I like to watch people make it. So I like the last thing I saw, they were making macaroni and cheese. Uh, yeah, macaroni and cheese with bacon, and then they roll it in Dorito crumbs. They make a ball, roll it in Dorito crumbs, and deep fry it. Oh. And it's just like, oh. what, the f what, do oh. like what do you think? Like, yeah, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? It's like the fried butter sticks. What the fuck are they? But thinking? see, but this is a good. I, I know. Go ahead. I know. What oh, you're but I was going to say. So when you start from that and mm -hmm. you go into raw milk and the lots of greens and mm -hmm. some grass fed beef, like. You're going to lose weight. Yes. You're going to do better. You're going to feel better. Recruit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the analogy I like to use is if someone's shooting you in the leg with a bazooka and the next person comes along and says, stop that and hit you in the leg with a crowbar, getting hit in the leg with a crowbar is going to feel like a sexual experience because it's so much less harmful than getting shot with a bazooka. And that's how a lot of these people are selling their pitch. Because if you're 350 pounds, you didn't get that way from too many hazelnuts. So when somebody steps in and wipes out all the entomins, wipes out all the junk, all the crap, and gives you any whole food, and then restricts volume, you're gonna do better. And a lot of people are thinking it's the specificity of what they're doing that's making them better. I mean, we could take obese people and give them the Twinkie diet right here. Have one glass of water and lemon an hour later, eat a Twinkie, do that three times a day, we'll be millionaires. Big, heavy people will lose weight because they're poisoning themselves less. But that doesn't mean the truth exists in what they're doing. Yeah, and because the body looks for any moment to self-correct itself. And correct. as soon as you take a lot of that burden off, it can then get to work. Sure, that's why macrobiotics work so well. Yeah. It's a moderately decent diet, but if you're coming off normal American, you're coming up the food chain pretty well. Probably if it's a thermometer, you're going halfway up on macro. For a person born into a strong body, that works. Now, here's something with this, and I know, again, what I think, being older than a lot of people who do these things, an advantage we have. If someone calls me up who's normal and tells me they're doing macrobiotic diet, I'm going to clap for them. Even though I know it's middle of the road, for that individual, it's a very good step. If a 400-pound man tells you he's doing zone diet, you clap for him. Because for a 400-pound man, zone diet is preventing him from killing himself. And for everyone out there who's a counselor, therapist, blogger, Instagrammer, or is getting paid to talk to people about diet, please remember, it's like sports. The great coach is the one who mixes his system to his players, not who forces his players into a system. So if a 300-pound former drug addict comes to you and tells you they're doing any diet, that restricts bad food, heavily bad food, and is calorically under control, you stroke them, you make them capable. You don't jam your precious truth down their throat. 
I tell people a lot of things I would never do at this point in my life, but I'm not talking to me, I'm talking to them. Yeah, when I first got into this and I lost the initial 60 pounds and I got into that deep, deep uh, cleansing and I was getting fevers and shit was popping out of my skin, which eventually led me onto your colonic table. Um, when I first got into that, I was eating brown rice pasta, quinoa, millet, brown rice, like the amount of macrobiotic type food. I was eating 50% raw food, but totally whole grain muffins. And all you were that. still cleansing. Oh, I, cle I lost 60 pounds. I sure. cleansed hard. Could you imagine if I got into raw food when I was that toxic? See, and, and that's why for people, you can have what you know to be the essential truth about what humans were meant to do. And to be honest, that's a really fun discussion. It's a really fun discussion to talk about breatharianism and eating little or nothing and sitting in the sun and what's the potential. Great fun stuff. That, does, that is not an application that you put upon or even mention to people who are coming to you to try to find some health. So you can have your philosophical truth, but you need your pragmatic application. And that's the issue with a lot of the people on the internet that are raw food vegan. It's not that they have the wrong facts. They don't realize all they have are philosophical ideals. And they try to push that upon the common person. And we know we've done this a long time. That leads to a lot of disaster. Mm -hmm. I wonder where they got all that stuff from. Because we were reading like Herbert Shelton. Hilton Hotima. Yeah. And like, are people still reading him? I have no idea. No. no. I, I can tell when I throw names out. Yeah. No. You know, what's, uh, you know what's pretty cool and I was thinking about earlier is that with all of the new diet stuff that goes on, all the new philosophies, all the new approaches, all the new biohacking, which is a term that I can't stand. Uh, biohack. It sounds like they're um, stealing somebody's mitochondria. Yeah. <laughs> like Filipino psychic surgery. <laughs> Just took your liver. <laughs> um, is that with our approach, your approach, my approach, Tom DeVito's approach, uh, Dr. Bishy, Joyce Rockwood, nothing's changed Thank in 20-something years. The, the, There's you. no new thing. Yeah. The, Thank nothing's you. changed. Thank you. Searching for a rainbow. I mean, I can, that's brilliant. I can rattle off supplements, concepts that were like, you know, they're kind of like Thai fatness, thin ties are in, fat ties are in. You go back... 1998 and you look at the things that were huge that nobody does anymore why because they don't work and you look at all the changes and the constant shifting but what we do we're not searching for a lot of answers because what we're doing is working you know mm -hmm. if you if you're doing a diet and it works you don't need a support group you don't need the internet you don't need to ask questions nor do you pay attention life. to new supplements you're just rolling you're doing it. That's a great point. Um, I like all those new products and stuff, but like I've basically been doing the same thing for 25 and if, years. Yeah. And if you ask yourself, all the new products you've tried, and I've probably tried 100, how many of them do you still do where they're, they're a part of it, like juicing, colonics? Two. Juicing? I mean, not including like colonics and right. cryo and all that kind of stuff, but just food things, the two things that I find the most, the real biohack, two most valuable things. Um, juicing. Still, number one. No, it's huge. Anybody that's not juicing is just leaving so much Gun on the table. Gun to my head, give up your food, you juice, you give up your food. Exactly. Especially juice in a city first. like this, 100%. Yeah. And um, fermented vegetables, properly oh, fermented vegetables. Fabulous. Um, I forgot what we were talking about. Uh, but I had asked you, I said, do we, do you, I said, is there anything that you want to include and, and, and talk about on this podcast? And you were like, I'm just going to throw curveballs at you, Mike. <laughs> what do you got lined up? Today? Okay. I, what I meant was... Um, and one of the things I love about doing this work is what I get from it from the clientele. Like people will come in and say things and I'm like, oh my God, life-changing information. And I had that happen twice this year. Now this may not directly connect to cells or elimination or longevity, but it's such fabulous information. And I think in this time where we have the political climate we have the sexual tension with all the sick, crazy men mm -hmm. making us all look bad, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of tension and anger. There's not a lot of inner peace. And I think with the people we see, like when the election happened, and most of our clientele are female, most of them are progressive left. I think we could agree on that, right? So when I came in and saw how angry and destroyed people were, it, it just really shook me, like really to their core. And somebody came in, and it's actually one of the few famous people I treat, I'm not gonna say the name, but 
we were speaking and she said something that so changed my perspective and it freed me. It freed me of a lot of stuff. And I, this is, I want to share this because it can really help a lot of people. Ironically, if you're the really conscious type of individual with a global mentality who really cares and feels the pains of the world, I mean, I have friends when they see what's going on with immigration laws in the US, it truly pains them. They're not just saying that it does because it sounds good, it truly pains them, which speaks very well of their character. But when this individual told me this, it was life changing. And this is what it was. In quantum physics, they teach that all that is real and all that exists is that which is in front of you. Your only responsibility as a human being is proper, loving, honest conduct, listening, empathizing, sharing with each individual that comes in your path. And the point is that if you treat somebody really well, the pay it forward is how the world heals. You don't bang an unconscious person over the head with your truth. It doesn't change anything. And when she told me that, literally, I kid you not, and you know me, I'm not one of these, you know, this burden just left me. And since that point, I make sure everyone I'm speaking to, I'm in that space of listening. And what it's done, every cashier in the places I shop for food knows me. Every bank teller knows me. The guy that sells me the paper knows me because I'm looking them in the eye, hey, how's your day, man? And it freed me. And you could see they know who you are and they stick. That was one thing. So for people out there, it is a very tumultuous time. You know, I, the people screaming at the non-vegans, the people screaming at the people who wear fur or screaming at people who don't throw out their plastic. They're not hearing you. You're changing nothing. Be nice. Clean there, cells can't be mean. <laughs> There's also this, um, there seems to be this ignorance around the fact that um, everybody's in a, in a process and everybody's at a different age, learning a different process, doing a different thing, and we're never going to impose our will on everybody, right Correct. or wrong. I had to give that up a long time ago when, yeah. I, when I, you know, when I was a very um, militant vegan and then, sure. I, and then you realize meeting people and you go, Oh, wait, no, that person was just me 10 years ago. And maybe they'll never eat like me. But they, they approach this with their own paradigm, with their own uh, you know, way of looking at things. And they're on their own process. And I can't try to get in there and control it. Correct. Yeah. When they speak to you and ask, wow, you're looking great. You're, you're beaming. What's the gig? Now mm -hmm. you do have a responsibility to tell them because they've opened that door. Yeah. But they have to open it. The Buddhists talk about you can only have a teacher when you have an inquiring student. And it, it just needs to get that way. That all this anger and, you know, if you voted for so-and-so, swipe left on the dating sites is rampant. My kids put me on the dating site. So when you read Wait, so it, wait, you use Tinder and... and you know, all those things. things. And you okay. see, if you voted for so-and-so, swipe left. I mean, I don't want to speak to you if you don't think like me. And no matter who it is they're talking about, that is never a conscious space to be. Mm -hmm. Ever. Ever. Uh, I had my friend Dennis on a podcast a couple of months ago, and he is like newly vegan and eating clean, and he's been sober for a couple of years. And he's like, as soon as I stopped drinking and put vegan on my uh, Tinder profile, he's like, my game went right down. And he would come right up to people's profiles. He goes, I couldn't count the amount of times it would say vegan swipe left. Yeah, oh, it's all over the yeah, place. Yeah, because the I, women too. Yeah, well, the women. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Vegan swipe yeah. left. And vegan swipe left. And again, I'm I'm an anarchist atheist, so this is not coming from a right-wing space. Vegan swipe left is no worse than Trump voters swipe left. Both are equally bad because it's forcing your belief system on someone else not even knowing who they are, they are or what their life experience is. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's narrow thinking. That's fascist. That's what gets a lot of people in trouble. Just because it's your opinion doesn't make it okay to take on that paradigm. Well, and you know, we're New Yorkers, so we have to, we have to, and are accustomed to living with everyone. So even though there's a lot of like frustration and anger sure. in the people on the street here, uh, there's a lot of acceptance too. Oh, I think so, and I, you hope so. You know what made me really sad? I a friend of mine posted this on um, on Facebook the other day, and it was like a, a video. It was a very well made video, and it was showing like the city streets and the subway in New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. And the, it was a very well-made video, and it had, like, really touching music. So I was like, oh, one of my good friends posted it. And I didn't want to say anything at the time. 
Uh, but I watched the video and it was talking about how, um, you know, in New York, it's a place where you can get overlooked and people won't even notice you're there and it could feel very lonely and you better not get in anybody's way and all this stuff. But, and I think they referenced September 11th or some other tragedy, but when something horrible happens, New Yorkers come through, they got all this heart. They got, and I thought, why do we need it? And I, I just, it made me feel bad. I like just for New Yorkers and, and for, a, and sometimes for the attitudes that I even had growing up, like this hardened attitude where we need something so horrible to happen to give us permission to be human. Yeah. It's like, I didn't well, find have anything proud. Like the video was trying to celebrate New Yorkers. And I was thinking, fuck you guys, which is me too. Cause I live here, but like, fuck that whole paradigm of like, we're these hardened motherfuckers. And, but, if something bad happens, we'll come through for you. It's like, how about you be soft and open and when everything's amazing, fine. When everything's fine. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I love New Yorkers when there is a tragedy. I mean, but um, yeah, I thought, what is this weird permission we give ourselves to not act like a human being? Very, very true. And then you go. I mean, I remember when I went to India um, many years ago. I was working with you when I when I had gone to India. It was really amazing because there was this uh, purity of soul. Like people would just like be staring at you. Because, you know, I was because I was obviously a foreigner and like people just stare at you and not worry about me getting angry or taking some issue with them, like looking in my eyes. And they just be like, what country are you from? Like they were just curious and wonderful. And after being uh, in India and being in, in, in certain parts of it that were very third world and um, just seeing the humanity and going like, wow, this whole thing that we have, at least in New York, like it's it's not. You know, it's interesting with that name and names, but I have a bunch of clients that work in the restaurant business, the club business, the hotel business. And they talk about how so many of the celebrities, I'm not going to say names, who do all the world saving, the hunger things, the save the whales, the save the poor. What, like Angelina it, Jolie or something? Those, like, I don't want to yeah. do names, but those kind of people, when you have to work with them one-on-one -on -one personally, they're tyrants. They're awful. Awful. And when I heard the list, I was stunned and disappointed. But... The point here we're making is it's the daily experience with what's real that counts because the other stuff is kind of a compensation for the subconscious knowledge that you're not doing well. So if I build enough schools, if I mail enough food, if I create enough foundations, I must be good. Rockefeller got away with it for decades. Mm -hmm. Built hospitals, schools, people think he's great. Read the history of the Rockefeller family. Not so nice to the people sitting in front of them. <laughs> You know, when you look awesome. at how any country runs, it's pretty heavy that how many aristocratic people are in the U.S. calling shots? 10,000, 20,000? Mm -hmm. Let's say it's 50,000. I don't think it's that much. Let's say it is. That's 50,000 people controlling 300 million. It's an amazing feat. And they're not doing it because they're stronger or have guns. They're doing it through manipulation. Yeah. Because if everyone got, I mean, I've said, if you want to do this with people out there, I've had this plan. I've always wanted to do this with you, Mike. Uh, gently and lovingly, not with the revolution banging, screaming shit. We'll not take part in that. Stop the consumerism for a year and watch what happens to the structure of who's running the game. I, I mean, I, um, I like the market. I just wish we would change a lot of the products that we make because I think we make a lot of just garbage. Unnecessary. Um, a lot of unnecessary garbage. Here's something interesting. You see how, you know, AI, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is sort of taking over. We have uh, things getting outsourced uh, and made in other countries. Everything's getting cheaper. People are getting laid off. And they're talking about having, um, they're talking about trucking. Like trucking is supposed to be gone in the next 10 years because yeah. everything's going to drive itself. And I don't know if it's true. I don't know if they'll be able to really execute on that. But that's what people are looking at doing with the self-driving cars. It's in California, cars. the self-driving yeah. cars, yeah. Self-driving cars, self-driving trucks, industries, you know, getting eliminated. I even talked to... Uh, a client uh, on the treatment table and he was a hedge fund manager and he was moving to Florida. And, um, and I said, well, you know, we were just kind of talking about his life and his move and he was going to go move to be near his, uh, his uh, in-laws and stuff. And he said, yeah, he goes, well, you know, I got, I'm going to have to find something to do down there. And I was like, well, you're a hedge fund manager. What do you mean? And he goes, he goes, yeah, but he goes, I have to leave soon. He goes, it's not good to be part of a, a dying uh, industry or something or not, or a dying profession. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like you're a hedge fund manager. You're not like a factory worker where they're going to get a robot to do it. I'm just trying to like think about this. And he said, artificial intelligence can predict the market a thousand times better than any human being. So we don't, they don't even need Whoa. us anymore. And I was like, oh, shit. But here's the thing. So Walmart makes everything cheaper, 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 cheaper. They lay off everybody in the whole thing. 
Who's going to buy it when nobody's working? We're going to get to a point where you won't even be able to buy the stupid <laughs> plastic everybody. pool for the backyard or whatever the hell everybody's buying. Or- and everybody's job is going to be making the machines that are artificial intelligence. intelligence. That's it. Yeah, so, gonna like, who's going to buy the shit? You know? Yeah, it's a wild thing. Um, it's a crazy thing. Yeah, artificial intelligence um, is, uh, I, and I don't even know the tip of it because I don't have time for anything anymore. I just basically live Let's it, be on live, my head. I think yeah. it's not our generation. Those yeah. things are for the kids, you know, coming up. I'm trying to stay relevant. I'm trying to stay with it. I joke around with Nick all the time because they talk about we're going to have lenses and we're going to have microchips on our brain and all this stuff. And I, like, I still can't get certain apps to work or the, or the thing. I'm like, can we just can we just get the banking? Can we get the banking app to load properly? I'm going to have a chip in my brain in the next five years. I would never put a chip in my brain, but you know, like nothing works. Phones crash. Yet we're going to have chips in our brain. I'm like, I'm sure we can do it, but. Um, That's great. You know, the other thing I was going to mention that a client told me that was so freeing, and it, this is great because this is a great segue, and um, it's funny coming off everything we're talking about. This guy, super cool guy, used to be a drug addict, alcoholic, was a mess, got his life together, does the diet and colonics pretty well, and he's very into being a good guy, and he is. He's fabulous. And what he does when he comes in for treatments, and it's so much fun for me, he brings books on CDs. And we listen to books. And they're not, I don't want to use the term self-help because that's a puke-worthy term. But he brought in this book, and I didn't know who the guy was. You might, Nick might. Apparently, he was a huge, mega influence in the early stages of the internet. His last name is Kelly. Do you know this guy? It's something Kelly. I forget the first name. No. But back in the 60s and 70s, he was one of the forerunners with all the guys that started all this stuff. So this was his book. I want to see if I can remember the name. So I the, the internet itself, like the, yeah, the, whole, the whole the whole network. He, he was like a programmer yeah. or a computer guy. Yeah. So Richie brought the book in this my client because he knows how much I don't like technology and how much he I used to think it was the end of the world and it's destroying people and everyone's like a crazy person on a cell phone and it's just and they're getting radiated and the blue light is killing them and what are we doing? We're gonna grow arms out of our back like Judd Nelson and Doc Backward, and it's a mess. I, I hear Rogan all the time on the Joe Rogan podcast, which I yeah. like a lot of the time. And they'll talk about, like, they, like he's he's like a, a, a science fiction and tech nerd. and like, right. so, so, like, they'll talk about, like, what are they going to do next? And they kind of, like, project and fantasize into what's going to happen next. And I'm like, all this shit's just killing us. We're yeah. not going to have any more metals in the ground. We're going to yeah. have all the mountains blown up. Well, We're this is have... what that's about. And I felt that way my entire life. You know that. I'm very non techy and, and I think it's the downfall of humanity. And then I heard this guy. And that he, Richie told me. He said, Gil, I'm bringing this to you because this guy loves tech. So he always had friendly arguments. He says, I'm not trying to turn your opinion. Kevin Kelly. Thank you. Thank Kevin you, Kelly. Good yeah. job. I'm not trying to turn your opinion, but I think this might calm you down about technology. And it did. And it changed my life. This was like two months ago. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember the exact words. But the guy's point was, yes, there's a lot of issues with technology. The blue light radiation, it's causing sterility, all these other things. People are becoming zombies. They're staring into phones. No one's talking. No one goes out. People are dating over the internet. They're counting friends they meet on the computer as real friends. What are we doing? It all looks tricky. He said, but what you want to understand with being human, the experience of being human is change. People change. They adapt, they change. And right now, this is all very new. This is the embryonic stage of a gigantic leap and shift in how we live. And the reason people are staring into phones and acting like zombies is because it's new. It's like when you learn to drive a car, you're obsessed with turning the key and which is the gas pedal, which is the brake. But in 10, 20, 30 years, it will all ease in. And he goes, yeah, it may be polluting the world, but remember this. And he started reading all these learned passages going back as far as Socrates, who actually was worried about the agora because of the music the kids were listening to and what they were wearing and their haircuts and what they were doing with different types of tools. And he said, I fear for the end of our world. And then he read all these passages right up to the coal engine. If you read what scientists were saying when they invented the whole concept of burning coal for fuel, these people, and these were learned men, and the root of what they said was the truth. But if you read what they said, 
They thought the world was going to be done 20 years after the fact. What they thought about TVs, what they thought about electricity, there were always people pointing at the effects on the world and thinking the world was over. And his point is, humans will change, they'll be fine. They always have been. They thought coal was going to kill us. They thought the steam engine was going to kill us. They thought the electricity from TV was going to kill us. We're still here. And we will continue to be here. Maybe we'll be fucked up. Maybe we'll be in wheelchairs. Maybe we'll be radiated. But we're still going to be here. And everyone needs to just relax and enjoy the fact that you're in the middle of one of the great human shifts of all time. You've got the privilege of watching a turn. Better or worse, we'll never know but a turn that hasn't taken place to this degree since the Industrial Revolution. And then he said this, and this I know this for a fact. He said, remember this, in 1900, the average American person, male, men, lived to 43. Mm. In 2000, it was 74. There was no technology in 1900 other than a couple of machines, and they died at 43. Now it's 74. And now, since 2000, it's about 77. So as bad as it is, and as polluted as it is, and as zombie-like as everybody seems, it's going to be fine. Because humans change. They're going to stay alive. And the minute he was done playing that, that was another... Atlas. Another lift for you. I haven't ripped technology really since. <laughs> I wonder sometimes... I mean, I, 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 you know, Gary if Vaynerchuk... You sit with it, it's pretty... And one last thing with that, too. He also said... Um, in regards to the same area, that there will always be people looking at things from the absolute and they'll see what's wrong. He says, but if you look at plastics, if you look at so many things, cutting wood, the wood is bad for the air, you light incense, he went to, but humans just adapt and move around and make things work and they will continue to do so. And then this, this is the point, the last point. We think we treat each other very poorly now. In a lot of ways we do. But if you study human history, the mutual respect that exists now between people is the highest it's ever been. Try being a woman 500 years ago in any city True. in the country. Try True. being a minority or a poor person. Try being in the, in, an untouchable in India 300 years ago. Yeah. As bad as it is, the respect that people have for each other, the humanity in people's law codes versus a thousand years ago when there was no technology, is far better now. And once he was done talking, I was free as a bird. And I haven't done a rant on technology since. You used to worry about technology? Oh, I hated it. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the downfall of humanity. I used to say that. As technology goes up, human spirit goes down. I haven't said it since. And I probably said it the day before he played that CD. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, a, it's, 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 it's there's two sides to it. I mean, there's no doubt that it's created so much opportunity. You know, um, but it's like Gary Vaynerchuk says it, it for and it's for us. It's Elvis shaking his hips on TV. Exactly. You know, it's that's like brilliant. Yeah, that's this guy's point. Brilliant. That's good. I'll get yeah. use it. I'll give but, you credit. But here's one thing. <laughs> Things are moving really fast now and mm -hmm. they're moving really fast in a destructive way, too, because we're just like, you know, we have all of this knowledge, no wisdom. You know, it's like Gandhi used to say. I think Gandhi used to say that about the West. Lots of knowledge, no wisdom. Right? right. Knowledge without wisdom. So we're like, look, we can make this and we can make this thing and we can do this plastic and we can do all this shit. And we're like rolling forward, just like trying to make the next great thing and rockets and phones and disposable shit. Sure. So I. When I look at it and I and I think about some of the, the movements that I've been a part of, like I could go live on a beach in Hawaii on a thing and like if we didn't need money and we didn't. Oh, you I know. could do it in two seconds. Yeah. As long as but I had music. I, I don't do it with no music. I don't know if a back to earth movement will save the planet. I think technology is going to have to save us because it's so overwhelming now with the levels of pollution. Like, yes, humanity will adapt, but at some point we're going to have to say, right, we got to fix some shit up here. Massive. And there's always been enough fixing to make us hang around. A little bit like now there's no so, more lead gasoline and things like that. Right. There's always enough fixing to keep people here. That was rough. When I was in India, I, I don't I don't think they were using leaded gasoline. Asia but, only does. Yeah, do they? Were I they think if lead? it changed, the change in the last year. Well, God, I, was I know in Manila, forget it. It's I was the there cancer in, the, rate so in the early 2000s. I was there. Last time I was there was 2005. And um, I would spend some time in the city and having been on a plane, bad air, all that. Then you get off, then you're in Mumbai. And then, like, I, w I hadn't seen this because I grew up here. And you would only see this from trucks. But the, the rickshaws would go by or certain cars would go by. And depending on how they had their, their um, thing configured, there would either be black smoke coming out of the back yeah. or white smoke coming out of the back. And I got so sick. sick. As soon as we got out to, like, the beach area and the palm trees and everything, like, three, four days later, all of a sudden I had, you know, like, 
a chest. Everyone's like, oh, you have a chest infection. I'm like, no, I don't have a chest infection. I was like, I'm purging all this set, this soot mm. out of my lungs. It's, it's um, bad over there. Yeah. So I remember one time I flew to the Dominican Republic and um, they can't, something happened. Some florally like flower smelling chemical got pumped into the cockpit. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was an insecticide because they used to do that. Um, in, uh, I know in some flights to, um, tropical countries, they used to, and I think they put it in the air supply now. I don't know. I, maybe I'm messing that up, but they would walk down the aisle with two cans of disinfectant sprayed over everyone's head while the plane was taxing before they got off. Oh yeah. Because Ooh. they don't want, you know, I remember one time I got on a plane, uh, what is leave, it leaving think India and there was like a they dozen mosquitoes to get on the plane. Sick and, and then complain? Or no, they, 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 they don't want, they don't want insects to survive the flight and get off in other countries. One time I got on a plane leaving India and uh, there was like a dozen mosquitoes on the plane and they were just biting everyone because, you know, it's just hot and yeah. tropical. And like we all get on the plane and the way they did it there is they didn't have the, um, what do they call it? Uh, they didn't have the, I can't think of the name of it, but they used to just put um, uh, these like rolling ladders up to the thing and you'd go outside and you'd walk up into these giant planes because they didn't have the same kind of terminal. Right. And like, so all these mosquitoes are like flying into the plane when you're doing <laughs> it. So anyway, so they would do that. And I was going, anyway, I was going to the Dominican Republic once. I think it was insecticide. And that's when I realized the two times I realized the sensitivity of being really clean because I was deep into oh, cleansing that lots of colonics, lots of saunas, yeah. fasting all tough. the time. And uh, they pumped tough. that stuff into the air and it smelled a little funny. And boom, my head just like <sighs> cemented, just mucus, cement. It was days. I had this stuff in my sinuses for days and it was like 90 degrees in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. It was miserable. And then it was getting tattooed. So, and this was only like three, four years. Let's see, what year was it? Yeah, it was probably only three, four years into me eating vegan. I wasn't even into like heavy raw foods yet. I don't even think I got into colonics yet, but um, I had some tattoos that were from the 90s that were like spread out all over. It was looking a little red hot chili pepperish. And I was like, let me like close this up a little bit, cover these tribal things up and stuff that was a little bit dated. And, and uh, so I got this like kind of half sleeve. Mm -hmm. Chris Garver did it. He's like super famous now because he was on Miami Inc., that show. But uh, this is before he was famous and he used to work at New York Adorned. And he, so I got this, this tattoo done. And after, and you, I used to just be really psyched. I was young. I was 20-something. I'd get tattoos. I'd be really excited because I thought they were cool. I got this tattoo. And the next day, the inflammation, I could feel the swelling in my lymph. And I was like, oh, shit. And then it just hit me because I was young and dumb. Like I, I was I was knowledgeable about food and stuff, but I just well, wasn't. Well, there's a lot of facets of this come to you as you live it. Uh, yeah, as you live it. And and I that's was like, a harsh a one second. for everyone. I was like, what is tattoo ink? I wouldn't eat tattoo ink. And then. I still really like tattoos, but I haven't gotten one since 1999 um, because of that reason. But I got very sick after oh, that. Sure. Fever is swelling. My whole arm was swollen. And that's a common thing. People talk about that. You get the, the tattoo sick. You get like this feeling that, you know, you get a little feverish after it. Not small ones, but when people get sizable work, they feel it right away. And um, I did a lot of research on tattoo pigment. And it's fascinating to me how many people are into cleansing or into vegan diets. And they call them organic vegan inks. But it's all heavy metal. Yeah, very heavy. It's all heavy metal. Yeah, and I did a lot heavy. of research. You go to PubMed, you go to Medscape, and uh, what they do is they'll take out lymph glands and they cut them, and there's a rainbow in them from all the tattoo pigment that gets stuck in the gland. It's yeah. just a bad deal. Yeah, but it's all heavy metal, so it is organic. It's natural, but you know when you look at these so greens. So hemlock. Yeah, yeah, Socrates, how that was. You know, yeah. there's a lot of bad natural stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, I oh, so yeah, I was talking about the sensitivity, you know, getting too clean and the sensitivity. Uh, it puts us in a strange predicament because we love this life. We want to pursue it, but we're living in a world that gets more and more toxic. Yeah, yeah. it's very hard. Um, and I hear this from a lot of people. It, it's it's very hard. Cigarette smoke, Lysol air freshener. I have women who come in with perfume. I'm like, look, I'm, it's not that you can't wear that. You know, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm literally dying. Do you, I know you've experienced this when a client comes in and everything's going well. And then all of a sudden you sit down, you're doing the treatment. And when we work on clients, I won't uh, explain too much about how this works, but your feet are in front of our face. Correct. And the women that come from, you see it right away. You see the shiny nails with the, uh, the cotton balls between the toes. Right, right. And then all of a sudden, oh, like you're getting, you're getting oh. dizzy. Oh. You're getting dizzy and you're like, wow. The nail it's just, polishy yeah. stuff. They're oh, like, it's deadly. Because they try to fit in all their stuff in one day. Yeah, so yeah. they do the nail thing and then they come to get a colonic Awful. and uh, who knows where they go next. But like, and you shut the door because it's a private treatment. And Kills it's just me. Like, I've, I've been yeah. tortured by that. that. I can't even walk into a nail salon. And that is difficult. And for a lot of people, it's a legitimate concern. And the only thing, because we get asked this a lot, the only thing I can say to... um 
you know, maybe ease it for people. A great quote from Galileo, the astronomer, one of my favorite quotes. He was locked up for telling the church in Italy that the sun was the center of the universe, not the earth. And they thought, you're crazy. God makes man in his image and the earth has to be the center. They locked him up. He went to prison. Then when Copernicus proved him correct, he got let out and they asked him, are you pissed? You know, you're angry. You rotted your life away here in jail and you were correct. He says, no, I'm not. And they said, how could you possibly not be angry? And he said this and it's huge. And this statement, I think, is why for people into this life, you only speak to people who ask you. You don't push it upon people. He said, because the truth will always be amidst the minority. And that's just the way it is. And this stuff, is, is it the truth because we think it? No, we didn't come up with this. We didn't develop this. We were lucky. It came to us. I hope it comes to a whole bunch of other people. But you know what that's I, the way it is. You know what I wanted to tell you? I wanted to bring this into this podcast. Earlier tonight, I was, um, it was when we were leading that workshop, Nick said something to me. And he said, uh, he was, so I was talking to someone else. And he said, I feel so fortunate that I'm able to like be exposed to all this and that I found this whole thing. And I found all these people I say here that at Vitality. I say that myself three times a day. And I sat in a lecture you were giving downstairs from Bonobos. Bonobos being named after the... the oh, the, Hygieia. The Hygieia. Yeah, that, yeah, it was the Hygieia You know what Center. followed us in those lectures? I'm not making this up. Gay Naked Yoga. True story. That's what we're, came in after us. Every Monday night, there was a lecture in Hygieia. I used to run it once a month, and there were other people. Every, after us, it went from, I'm not making this up from eight I to I didn't ten. know this. It's gay Naked Yoga. Just a side note. So wait, what did we We did, we did like... A whole new definition of down with dog. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Not there's anything wrong with that. Okay, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Little so, Seinfeld there. Bonobos was a raw food restaurant that let the what the Hygieia Center was that's that what, what it was, was called? called? Yeah. Do their workshops uh, in the basement, and uh, so you were giving a lecture at that. You know, just right before the the gay naked yoga, um, you were giving a talk about I don't remember what something about raw foodism or you know something like that and colonics and. And I was there learning and I was working with you at the time. And like, I was just sitting there and I thought to myself, I thought I'm so, I said a little prayer. I was a gratitude prayer. I was like, I am so thankful. I'm so happy I'm exposed to all this stuff. You know? Oh, I, and thank so you. Happy. And I say it all the time. Yeah. Like, all right, where would I be if I, and I got into this from being deathly ill, but the way I was living before I got sick, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. So I think I'm feel very fortunate. And that's why I know for a fact that when this has worked for you, and you see people who haven't been exposed to it, the response is sadness and, and you feel bad for them. You don't get mad at them. Mm -hmm. See, and that's why that anger response all over the internet is coming from a place of people who haven't succeeded, whether they know it or not. I would love for us to do a podcast where you and I just go through, I, I'll, just, I'll just line up a bunch of YouTube videos and then we'll just roll through them. Oh, and I, I would love to get your commentary on that. Yeah. And I think we should bring Tom in on that one oh, too. Oh God. Yeah, that would be great. That would be I'm amazing. In. I also, if you ever want to do it, the party of five idea, dinner for five. Remember I'd John like, Favreau's show? I like that idea, but do you see how complicated yeah. this, this this little setup is? Yoshi could do it. My oh, friend Yoshi. Yeah, that's he's a good idea. He would I love do Yoshi. It. He's so fabulous. Great. Yeah, fabulous guy. But he would you, do it. That would be fun. Yeah, we can we can soon. I mean, you know, we're gonna. I'm hoping I could elevate this whole game very yeah, soon. But sure. uh, let's start with the YouTube uh, uh, commentary one day. Yes, I'm in. I'm in. Cool. And remember, well, everybody, stop buying stuff. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work.